Hi, I'm Lucian. Um, I'm in Miranda Mellis's program, Impossible Objects, and Studio Archive Field with Julia Zay. Um, pleased today to introduce Kaya Sand, um, who is a poet, artist, teacher, and activist. She's the author of the books Interval, Remember to Wave, A Tale of Magicians Who Puffed Up Money That Lost Its Puff, and co-author of Landscapes of Descent, Guerrilla Poetry and Public Space with Jules Boykoff. Her projects don't live solely on the page. A Tale of Magicians Who Puffed Up Money That Lost Its Puff is also the name of a magic show, a component of her Happy Valley project, which is a poetic investigation of the relationship between housing, foreclosures, and financial speculation. Kaya Sand has sledgehammered poems onto copper and embroidered them onto fabric. She's written collaborative poems and helped students write collaborative poems through repetition and research. Her poetry is often described as investigative, but this research is not means to an end that is mastery. Rather, it is a pursuit, an opening, a gathering of ideas and ways of knowing. Conscientious and expert voices matter, she suggests. Sand teaches classes with titles like Poetry in the Archives, Poetry in Politics, and Never Built Portland. She says she relishes how teaching demands both her careful, attention, careful design and her flexibility, which to me seems also a good recipe for poetry. I see her work in conversation with other artists we've had in previous years at this lecture series. Like social practice artist Cassie Thornton, Sand makes art about debt and uses artistic and popular education models to study economics. And with Alison Cobb, Sand shares a commitment to research and the archives in her poetics. As an artist in residence with Gary Imatani at the City of Portland Archives and Records Center, Sand engaged with surveillance files on civic and activist groups by the Portland P Police Bureau, which resulted in the Watcher Files Project, a series of artistic and poetic interventions into these documents. Excuse me, I'm gonna pull up a quote that Eric sent me um, from an interview with Daniela Molnar um, just this morning. Um, sorry. It says, when I'm working in the lyric mode of poetry, a social lyric, I'm seeking some kind of ethical attention toward people I may never know. But when I think about surveillance, attention becomes threatening. Sometimes we can see someone, but should we be able to? I wrote this line, your face exposed to the bright threat of attention. While I usually think of attention as something positive, attention can be so difficult to give someone after all. Attention can also be threatening. I feel like I'm experiencing vertigo with the ways in which our lives are public. I don't know what to do. I was already going to read the poem that that's from, which is called A Fire With Purpose. In the breath, in the bright threat of attention, the surefire glare of recognition, you become a public person, mindful of those who live downriver and downwind from the malice of power, downtrodden by disregard, upbraided by rancor. For them, you, heart sure, a fire with purpose, you become a public person. In my own research for this introduction, I discovered that Kaya respects people who keep their office doors open. And I thought it telling that on her website, her biography is at the end rather than the beginning of the page. She lives in Portland, where she directs a street newspaper called Street Roots. Today, she's going to speak about an interrelationship between art, poetry, journalism, and community organizing in her work, particularly regarding homelessness and income inequality. So please welcome Kaya Sand. OK. 
Okay, thank you very much, Lucian. Thank you, Miranda. Thank you, Karen and Gemma and Roxy and Roscoe for setting me up today. And thank you, everyone else who worked on this. This is quite amazing, as always. I always feel like people just do things better at Evergreen. I'm always <laughs> kind of um, a fan of what you do here. So um, I am going to use these two street newspapers actually as a way to um, bookend my talk. And they're really the same street newspaper. Um, the Burnside Cadillac was in Portland um, in the 1990s, and I was a staff reporter for it in 1998, 20 years ago, writing articles about the criminalization of homelessness and affordable housing and all these things that I'm still <laughs> writing about. Um, and then I left in 1998 um, to really dive fully into poetry. But now 20 years later, I'm back. Now it's called Street Roots, but it's the same paper. It's just that it was 70 vend or seven vendors then who were experiencing homelessness and poverty, and now it's about 170. It was a monthly then, and now it's a weekly. So I felt like those the, the, that 20 years bookends things really nicely for me to talk, um, because in a lot of ways, my time at Burnside Cadillac propelled me into thinking about poetry in relationship to investigation and journalism. Does this sound OK? Yeah. Oh. And, um, <laughs> And then now my time at Street Roots, I've, I have all of this, these last 20 years that I'm carrying back into journalism. Um, but even as I say that, you know, I, I move all over time. Let's see. Turn something up. I can just use the screen. Yeah, I'll use the screen, or the keyboard. Um, and so when I was writing for Burnside Cadillac 20 years ago, I did one article on PECUN, the farm workers union that's in Oregon, in Woodburn, Oregon. And they had signed their first union contract. So I wrote a, a news article about that. But then I kept feeling like I wanted to write about it uh, with some lyricism. So I wrote a poem called The Fruit We Eat. And I really marked that as the first time I was kind of finding that way of moving, of finding my um, my materials and my form um, and sort of shifting around it and thinking about investigation. And after that, I moved um, to Washington, D.C., and I started working with a poet named Carolyn Forche, who I really sought out because she was working in this mode of poetry of witness and had been living in El Salvador during the Civil War and wrote a book out of that experience. And I was really interested in, um, again, that kind of the meeting of investigation, journalism, and poetry. Um, this right here is a poem in its early draft. Um, it looks pretty tame on the page. Um, but it's called Aquifer. And it was my um, effort to investigate Water, pol water politics um, through poetry. So I was cutting up World Bank documents and doing interviews and doing walks and really thinking um, through all of these um, demands on water. And during that time, one thing that Carolyn said to me that was really important, and it just courses through everything I do, is she said, you know, people sometimes tell you that you should write what you know, but you can always know more. And I love that, because that's really more what I'm interested in. I'm interested in what I don't already know, right? I'm interested in what's, com what's complex, and I want to move into it, what's concerning, what's you know, the struggles that are before us, all those things that aren't immediately just sort of representational for the page. Um, and then I went on and was living in southern Maryland. This is kind of a, a precious photo I was pulling up, actually, for this, because the woman next to me is Lucille Clifton, and she only died a couple years ago. She's an um, extraordinary poet, if you haven't already read her work. Um, but this was the last job she had before she died. And um, she didn't drive, so I got to drive her around sometimes, and we'd go on field trips. And one time she took me to a cemetery, and she said, look around. You know, where are the graves of the enslaved people of this region? And I said, I don't know. And she said, exactly, but they're here. You know, they're just, 
it's the rocks are somewhere, the wood is decayed, right? Maybe the rocks have been used in a replica, the replica state house in our county. So how do you use your imagination to read our political geography, right? How do you, how do you see what, what is difficult to see? How do you see the imperiled history? So again, kind of like the, you know, you can always know more, this, this idea of having a kind of imagination for political history and geography that Lucille instructed me to do um, mattered very much to me, and ca I carried it forward. When I moved um, via Walla Walla, Washington, back to Portland, Oregon, and I started really looking at one spot in Portland, Oregon, along the Columbia Slough. It's um, the Expo Center, so it's right before you cross over to Vancouver, Washington. And I was actually going out there to, at the time, women's roller derby matches were there, so I would go out to watch roller derby, and I learned that this is where um, Japanese Americans were incarcerated during World War II in Portland. So I started really moving into this history. Um, I mapped it, I mapped a walk for myself to just walk the space and think about what Lucille asked me to do and try to figure out how I could read this space with this kind of political history that's not immediately uh, visible. I mean, it is visible in some ways. You know, it's visible. There's the sort of buried railroad tracks where the trains are that actually people were taken to the inland concentration camps, like Minidoka. Um, so there's, they're, they're sort of deep down in the ground. There's the wooden pillars in the Expo Center that were there when people were rounded up and imprisoned there on May 5th, 1942. Um, they were, um, it, it was formerly a livestock hall, so um, people put plywood down, and so people were just kind of living over the manure, squashed, you know, into this space. Um, so, and then there is some art there that also is recognizing that history by Valerie Otani, that's an incredible art. Um, so I started taking people on walks, and um, really asking people what they noticed, you know, teach, t uh, reading my work to them, um, and letting the, the, the work itself build. This is sort of a Ars Poetica in a sense for it, an opening poem um, that, that also, you can tell a lot of things, they sort of just stay with me. Um, and this is, again, something that I just carry then forward. Um, how do I notice? what I don't notice. How do I notice what I don't know I don't notice? In expert, I notice with the attention and drifting inattention of poetry. In expert, I investigate. In expert, I walk and I walk. So I was really interested in um, this idea of the inexpert investigation, that I didn't need to own this history. In fact, it was my responsibility not to. Right? I always had to th look at my own position to it and keep the space open for inquiry, inviting other people in. Um, this, this is actually a still from a video from one of the walks, but I love how the little suitcase actually from the last frame ends up in it, the idea that people brought just what they could carry. That's what they were ordered to bring. Um, and that's the Expo Center right there where people were imprisoned. Um, part of the walk is really loud. It's a long marine drive where trucks pass by. So instead of reading, I, I lay down poems that were written in Tule Lake, um, which was the, the camp on the border, of, uh, California side of the Oregon border where people that actually refused to sign loyalty oaths were, were sent. Um, I'm really interested in this idea of historical or situational rhymes, and I'll come back to that a little bit later too. Um, but one of them was I just became very interested that on this walk now there are these portable on demand storage units. So thinking about this idea of people being incarcerated there with only what they could carry and that now there's this kind of monument to possession, right, that's right at the same spot. Um, I also was interested in other rhymes with this though because surrounding the Expo Center would have been Vanport. And Vanport was the second largest city of the World War II city created for shipbuilding in Oregon. A number of African American families moved in um, to, to Oregon at that point, and um, as well as many other communities. Um, and it actually was flooded out in 1948. 
Um, so I became really interested in the fact that with portable and demand storage units, about the time I was working on this with Hurricane Katrina, some people had actually taken refuge in portable and demand storage units. And then the company responded by trying to invent one that could be used for disaster shelter. So there's all these kinds of rhymes, right? They became really interesting um, to me. Another one, I'll just read a little passage from the opening essay. We might also connect the Vanport flood to further displacements that would occur nine years after Vanport was demolished, 90 miles upstream at Celilo Falls. As federal officials sought to build dams on the Columbia River, they argued for irrigation water and cheap electricity. It would provide flood control. Despite more than 12,000 years of native gathering and fishing at Celilo Falls, and despite treaty rights that promised the right of taking fish at all usual and accustomed grounds and stations, Dow's Dam was built. On March 10, 1957, the massive gates of the newly constructed Dow's Dam closed, and six hours later, Celilo Falls was smothered in the raised and backed up water. <coughs> So I always see these kinds of investigations as ways in which I can move through the elsewhere and the erstwhile, right? What are all the different connections um, you know, across geography and through time um, that, that happen? Another kind of rhyme that I was interested in is the, so I, from my program from Roller Derby had an autograph page. And a lot of the Roller Derby um, athletes for my book, actually, it's a page in this book, they signed an autograph page. Um, and I became interested in all these other kinds of autographs. At Tule Lake, the concentration camp I mentioned that's on the California side of the border, there's a number of names of people who are incarcerated there carved into the cliffs where also the petroglyphs, the Modoc, and the Klamath people are. So there's these kinds of um, the tags, in a sense, right, of, of, of imperilment. Um, there is, uh, while people were incarcerated in the Expo Center, it was called the Portland Assembly then. I think he, up here closer is Puyallup, um, where people were first taken. Um, there, the people there did all kinds of amazing things to just, you know, resilience, right? To just figure out how to keep going in those months. And one of the things um, a number of people did is created a mimeographed newsletter called, kind of cheeky, uh, the Evacuazette. And they would create this in the Expo Center. And the final issue, when then people were sent to uh, Heart Mountain, Minidoka, Tule Lake, um, had an autograph page at the end because people had formed right relationships and friendships. So this idea that people might sign um, this book for each other. So I, at first, really wanted to find a copy that had that autograph page. Um, but then I realized maybe that this is something for me to think about writing, but how, do I, how would I write it and not be taking on other people's experiences? So I, I, I limited, I created a constraint for myself um, that was that it was all information that I gathered from issues of the evacuazette, so they could sort of speak back to me. Named in a word or so, now I know you were here. Are where? Erstwhile. Hello, baby boy Shimizu, born July 6, 1942, 842 p.m., 7 pounds, 7 ounces. Hello, baby girl Onichi, July 10, 1942, 9.08 a.m., no weight reported. Hello, baby boy Yoshihara, July 21, 1942, 2.54 p.m., 6 pounds, 2 ounces. Hello, Boy Scout Troop 123, Explorer Troop 623. Hello, new arrivals, evacuees, colonists. Hello, chain gang baseball team. Hello, Katz Nakayama, home run hitter, electrician foreman. Hello, Albert Oyama, ping pong champion, Hito Heat, Hayamoto, Jumbo Murakami, Grand Slammer, the old, sl the old timers, the bachelors, the farmers, the townies, the dishwashers, the Fuji baseball teams, the Wapato Wolves and Country Sister softball teams. Hello, first aid givers, talent show MCs, chicken pox sufferers, dip Theria immunizers, calisthenic teachers, cake bakers, kindergarten teachers, modern, model airplane builders, chatty neighbors. Hello, zombie day dancers, sugar beet pickers, Issei, Nisei, Sansei leaders, hello. 
Hello, me, Dora Baker, separated from your parents, carceral childhood, and I worry about you. Hello, Akira Shimuro, six years old and dead on July 10th, 1942. Hello to the cook on break in the sun, too near the fence, suddenly shot by guards, the blood on your white coat another man remembers, wondering what happened, so do I. Hello to the journalists watching the Jansen Beach Ferris wheel lights from the evacuazette balcony, knowing that is outside. Hello Sunday visitors speaking at the barbed fence. Hello Michi Yasunaga and James Wakagawa betrothed June 29th, 1942. Hello Madame Fifi Suzette talent show impresario. Hello Chiseo Shoji cartooning the fly swatters, the toe stompers, the clog clompers bound from Minidoka Heart Mountain. Hello Rose Katagiri, evacuazette typist bound for Tule Lake June 10th, 1942. The Katagiri family in the the Akagis and the Moriokas and the Yamaguchis and the Watanabes bound for Tule Lake, bound carceral. There are so many of us on this planet. Um, so I went on, you know, and with this, with this particular book, it was interesting to let it continue to be open and change. Um, there's one woman I came to know whose mother was first. Um, first uh, incarcerated in, at Portland Assembly Center, and then she ended up living in Vanport, as I kind of suspected would have happened, and it did happen a number of times, where families would return from the camps, and they had lost their homes, and so they ended up in this wartime housing that became a kind of public housing before it flooded out. Her mother was flooded out. Um, so she began to tell her stories. We would lead more walks. I just kept kind of gathering in, gathering in, until the Oregon Nikkei Legacy Center asked me to start working with people who are homeless in what was Japantown. Um, and now a number of people who are homeless live called Old Town in Portland. It was Nihon Machi. It's actually where I work now at Street Roots. And um, she wanted me to, uh, uh, the people at Oregon Nikkei Legacy Center that, that really focuses on Japanese American history, the diaspora, um, they wanted me to start working with um, making these connections, bringing people whose ancestors experienced internment or maybe they're, um, they did themselves working with some elders and then folks who are homeless. Um, so I worked especially, this man here, Leo Rhodes, um, I worked especially with, at the time he was homeless, he isn't now, he's an incredible organizer. He actually is a Street Roots vendor and was on the board and he started a, t a tent city in um, Seattle, in Mercer Island, um, and he started uh, Right to Dream 2 in Portland. Um, and he wrote a poem uh, where he actually realized he had grown up on the Gila River Reservation and he realized these remains that were there were actually the remains of one of these camps that people, Japanese Americans, were, were imprisoned. And elders could never, never quite explain it to him because it was so painful. Um, so he, he ended up doing readings with the person who was then the poet laureate of Oregon, Lassani Nada, who also wrote about the, that same space. So um, I just, I, I love how uh, when we cr make, create open spaces, through art and community organizing also, um, the ways in which people come together in really unexpected ways. And they continued to read all over the place together after that. Um, another, um, after that, a project that I worked on, the Happy Valley project that Lucian mentioned, um, again, kind of moving in those spaces, thinking about community organizing as well as art and the form, social forms, poetry. I moved into this investigation around the housing collapse. This was you know, following 2008, but moving all the way into 2010. And I was, I played with this model that I did um, again and again called Econ Salon, um, where how can I use sort of the, the trappings and the pleasures of our, the way we gather for art to get people together for other reasons too, get economists in the same spaces, get organizers. So a big one that I did um, was in December 2010. This is Ibrahim Mubarak. I've continued to work with him to this day, but he started Right to Survive, it's a houseless and formerly houseless run organization in Portland. And um, I had organizers, oh, I slipped that slide of my daughter when she was young working on the econ salon in there, I guess. Um, and, um, and part of the econ salon was that I wrote a magic show for it um, to, to discuss the housing 
uh, foreclosures, the financial collapse. And this is something I actually updated last year with the Trump administration and performed with a few new tricks up my sleeve. Um, still, still a pretty um, uh, unskilled magician, but um, at the time I was performing with a professional magician, so that was a, a little bit better. Um, a right to Survive created an art installation that was a dollhouse squat that they found in an alley. And, um, and part of what I did is I embroidered as a way of knowing, a way of thinking. I often, um, thinking, knowing, listening are all pieces of what happens when I move into my subjects. And I was reading a lot about finance and thinking about the obfuscation that happens and how did I, how could I bring this kind of materiality to it. Um, so this is a poem that I ended up writing and I'll read, um, I'll read that poem. Beware the fury of the financier. Beware the fury of the financier. Rote fury, puffy money, bankers who bank on diverted attention, divested power. I attend to a kestrel showing its shadow to the morning floor. My neighbor's crusty music, my daughter's trusty lemur doll. A train sooty and passing four stories below. Power. This is a sentence about synthetic collateralized debt obligations, a bit of what gets lost in the paper, shuffle of profit, doorway to a shelter, roof sloped to slide rain, bankers bilking a plenty. I'm riveting my attention now. And after that, I worked for a couple years um, in the city archives, which Lucian was mentioning in terms of working with these surveillance files that Portland police kept on um, activists and um, activists in the 1960s, 70s, and early 80s in Portland. That's Garrick Imatani with me, um, and we, we did this as a team. And one of, the, one of the things that we were really interested in, again, that kind of journalistic, investigative piece to the work that um, I do is I found this photo of Lloyd Marbet, who was an activist. This is from the early, late 60s. This is the first place that we found him in the files. He especially, um, over the years, really worked on issues around um, uh, the siting of nuclear power. And, um, and he sort of trained himself to be a kind of citizen, um, like citizen attorney in a sense. You know, he would go in and he would fight. Um, he would go into all these hearings. He was indefatigable and quite amazing. Um, but one of the things that we found was this surveillance document of him asserting that he had all these things in his truck at one of the hearings. Um, the above listed gasoline bottles and rags were obviously components of firebombs. However, they could be, not be considered firebomb under Oregon rev, uh, revised statute. It also talks about, you know, his dog, he had a, 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 a large dog and um, trying to see some of the other things. Well, here, so, so when, I, when, when um, I went out and interviewed him, and he did a kind of talk back to this document. So I created an overlay, I silk screened an overlay for it. And um, you know, he talks about why he had gas. I had gas because I, when I went up into the woods, I didn't know if I'd have enough gas to get back. Probably some wine bottles in the back. Um, he said, I had a big bushy beard. I had this old mutt, easy, I love my dog, kind of talking back. Oh, they, they said he had a German Shepherd. And he said, I didn't realize that they'd take a look at my old mutt and turn him into a German Shepherd. I had no idea they were looking in the back of my pickup truck and seeing these empty wine bottles and then seeing some rags and then that gas can and lo and behold, there's all the ingredients for Molotov cocktail. I had no idea they had cooked that stuff up. So it's really a fun process to, to be able to at least um, be able to have people speak back to the, the city um, documents, right, that are, that are in the archives. Um, I interviewed him quite a bit. I'd walk around this land that he caretakes in, Oregon, in Estacado, Oregon. Um, I love this. It's kind of bookshelf of his sign, his political signs in one of his trees. Um, and then, but he was such an extraordinary storyteller. 
And so I, I felt like there were these contours to his stories. So I just would listen to them, and I gave myself the constraint of these two pages, and I would write them like this with watercolors. Is often how I write to slow myself down. And that would give me the shape of his stories. And I ended up creating this sequence of um, seven of them that tell really how he became an activist and um, you know, some of the story of that. Um, and, and through that process, I would hear his language which I loved, and I created refrains for the poem. And then I worked with him on this, and he revised. And um, it turns out later on he told me that he always wanted to be a poet, but then he realized really he wanted to be a poem. <laughs> so that's, it, it worked out, you know. So, and it was called, um, so he raised his hand, because when he first was in a hearing and he was looking around waiting for someone else to try to, you know, stand up um, against the sighting of this nuclear plant, and no one was, he said, so I raised my hand. And I just love that because, not, I mean, he didn't go back after that. Um, and there's one of the little, little refrains that I wrote um, that really rhymes with what Lucian, that poem that Lucian read in the beginning. Um, and I realize I've been exploring this idea of the public person over and over. The trillium purples its white leaves as summer deepens its seasons. And he became a public person and he became a public person. And I think this project really just um, brought that home in ways that were really startling to me, the kind of courage that it takes for people to step into these spaces, right? They become, as Lucian was talking about in terms of that vulnerable attention, right? That, that um, there's a lot of courage that that involves. Um, I, I collaborated with a letterpress artist on a whole kind of series for that particular poem. So you can see that same little refrain that I just read about the trillium. Um, I also worked with an artist named Kent Ford, or an activist named Kent Ford, um, an extraordinary man um, in Portland. He uh, founded the Portland chapter of the Black Panther Party, um, the Breakfast for Children program in Portland. They started a health clinic, a dental clinic. And the first way he entered the files was through this a surveillance document after he had actually called the police because he had been robbed. And then they ended up creating this kind of possible subversive document because of the books he was reading and the posters he had, which he had mostly bought at Reed College Bookstore. Um, but so I ended up working with him on this project because he's such a reader. And I feel like, I felt like he was starting to enter into a lot of articles now. People were really recognizing his contributions. But this was an area that I wanted to make sure that he was remembered for is that he reads and read so much. And in the early days of this chapter, the Black Panther Party, they were swapping books so much. So I had him create a book list of um, books through um, until now, uh, books that have informed his brain. And then we created a bookshelf. I got all the books. I got the books uh, that were as close to the editions as I could find that he would have read. And they're in the city archives now, so that when you walk in in the waiting room, all of, that's all there. Um, and I also, through that process, made a little brief biography of him through the books that he reads as a pamphlet, really kind of honoring that form that had been important. And just a f another project I did in there um, was she had her own reason for participating. And that was really trying to think about um, what, has poet what does poetry teach me that I can bring to investigation? And one of the things that I could do is a kind of procedure um, as a way of knowing, because I knew women were being surveilled a lot in these files. This is like in the 70s and the ways in which feminism was um, tr uh, transpiring in the streets of Portland. And so I actually used the pronoun she um, as a constraint in the files, and I lifted every single sentence that started with she and created this, this um, a poem called She uh, Had Her Own Reason for Participating. And it actually started, this was a, um, a newspaper, feminist newspaper, Lavinia Press, that the police had surveilled. And one of their articles was about a woman, a memoir about a woman's mother who worked in a garment factory. And it had this amazing sentence in there. She, had, she was always hunched over the machine. So that's what started this poem. She was always hunched over the machine, and that became one of these cards. I found my form um, because the police had kept 
little index cards on all of the activists and groups, I mean, so many of these cards. And so I then borrowed that form to create my own talk back of all the ways in which I found this language in the files. And then this became something in installations that people read in this way. You can see this is in the North Portland branch of the library. This is the um, poem that Lucian read from. It's a triptych of three, so the first two really explore um, how anonymity does happen in the files. And then the third one is about being exposed and public. Um, this has been in a lot of different places. I embroidered black on black, really interested in the illegibility of that um, and the, you know, exploring that idea of surveillance and anonymity. Um, it actually now is in one of our city commissioner's offices, Chloe U. Daly, so it's kind of an interesting sort of journey through the city collection um, into that space. Um, and then I, I did a uh, residency in Rio de Janeiro, and I was, um, again, really interested in this idea of, of listening always, right, and bringing in what, what um, is unexpected. So I would embroider all of the work I did in public spaces and, and learned a lot about people's grandmothers by doing this and, and uh, worked away at my Portuguese that was really dodgy. Um, but these, all these pieces, then I actually they're installation pieces, but I worked with worked on them in public spaces. Um, but through this process, real kind of talked back to me. I mean, there there's just the most amazing uh, pichasau, like the graffiti that's on um, written all over the place. This is the street is yours. Um, I read, I forget. Or, I mean, I write, I forget. Everybody lies except me. <laughs> That's great. Um, <laughs> um, and then this one is all over the place. Fui creamy sobre poesia. I was crime, I will be poetry. And what's really interesting, there it is again, is it showed up in Vila Todromo, which is a favela that was destroyed, leveled um, for the Olympics. And so I was there right before the Olympics happened, and the people of Vila Todromo were really fighting back in this beautiful way that's informed a lot of my work since, where they um, the city had a centralized plan for how Vila Todromo should be uh, raised and then redeveloped. And the people in the favela, including the children, and they worked with universities, created people's plans, people's plans after people's plans. Everyone was drawing up what they thought their favela should be, right? Um, and then they consolidated it into really a really powerful plan. Um, there are ways in which you know it just wasn't possible to uh, create it from this kind of technocratic, you know, way. Because for for one thing, there's a really important condomble um, part part a practitioner there. And this lagoon right here was the exact body of water where she needed to do her practice. So there are ways in which, you know, the the very particular uses of the land um, could not be planned from other people. Um, and that language was all over the place, but you could see where the favela had already started to get leveled. This is one fui crimi sobre poesia, just simply a stairwell that was left. Um, and there was a lot of talking back, fighting back, the rights of the poor, um, the, 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 the poor, let's see, the rights, the poor have rights and should not be expelled. Um, everybody, um, not everyone has a price, that's amazing. And then this was all over the place. Now, fui, um, eo, it wasn't me. And I just started as a practice embroidering some of it. So this is my now, fui, eo, now, fui, eo, and also translating it. Um, but during this time, I met a street vendor named Marcia. And she reached out to me, actually her friend did, and he, he saw my embroidery sticking out of my bag, and he told me that Marcia was a, did beautiful embroidery. And so Marcia, um, this is one of the stands where she would sell at. She actually sold at the one, no, she sold at that one. You can see the red kind of bikini there on the corner. She crocheted those, so they're extraordinary. Um, and she started teaching me this form of embroidery that I hadn't done before, but then she presented me with this embroidery, this right here, and she asked me to write a poem, to make it into a poem. And it was one of these moments, you know, sometimes I feel like when I've written things, they, um, 
they continue to speak to me and I don't know what they mean. And all of my, my language with Remember to Wave about what is, what is open is left open. You know, that idea of like when you open up spaces, things happen, but you can't necessarily control that. And I think sometimes for all of us, especially, I mean, I know for me, I can get really busy and just start to kind of move ahead. And it's very hard sometimes to respond in those moments. But this was one of those moments, right, where she presented me the possibility of a poem. And I really thought a lot about it um, because I wanted it to be a poem for her. It really brought me into that space of the ode, you know, where you write directly for someone. And that's who really matters in that moment. So I made myself write in Portuguese. I had, like, my daughter's school friends help me, you know. Um, but uh, I wrote a poem for her, an ode to her in Portuguese. And I embroidered it very big. Um, and she actually presented it out in the plaza, and the other vendors gathered around and read it. And so that was... Um, extraordinary in terms of thinking about audience, particular audience. So this is, this is the poem. Marcia me borda um sol, se tornando uma passiflor, o fogo do maracujá, roxo centrada, dorada, petilada, generosidade floresce nesta rua, aonde Marcia está. Enquanto centenas de pessoas a pé passando. Ela costura com uma agulha de ouro. Marcia cria uma passi passibilidade pela amanhã com os fios de hoje. Marcia embroiders me a sun, turning it into a passion flower, the fire of passion fruit. Purple-centered, golden-petaled, Generosity blooms in the street where Marcia is. While hundreds of people walk past, she sews with a golden needle. Marcia creates a possibility for tomorrow with the threads of today. So, and then I ended up, you know, exhibiting that with her son, her passion flower. Um, and that was fun to document it, get it back to her. She's not on social media, but her daughter is. So <laughs> that's one way that I'm able to do it. Um, I returned to Portland. And when I'm talking about kind of the ways in which you know, poetry helps me think about community organizing, about investigation, about, or, um, about um, investigation, community organizing, um, I also started to realize that I was seeing some of the community organizers as some of the most creative people. So I became really interested in kind of the other direction. And Right to Dream 2 is a, um, it's a, it, it's a, it was a place in Old Town that people who were houseless um, created sort of a, a, a place that was like a, a shelter in tents. It was all self-governed, um, really, really well managed. And over 100 people were able to sleep there and be protected at night. And one of the things that they really taught me, um, one of the things was just incredible creative, tactical brilliance. Because they, they held this space in all kinds of interesting ways, from suing the city to you know, figuring out alliances to just doing things that um, were always unexpected from um, what folks might expect when people are disenfranchised. Um, they created these doors to give visibility and also this kind of metaphoric you know, um, potency to this space. Um, this is Leo Rhodes, who I had mentioned before. And he would give poetry readings sometimes in front of the space. Um, this is one of the things they really taught me during, from working with them is just that importance of sleep. You know, the fact that sometimes we, people look as though maybe it's substance abuse or maybe it's a, a mental illness. And it could be, but it also could be sleep deprivation. And all of this gets tangled up and amplified together and you know, on the streets. And so if we can just simply protect sleep, it does so much for people. So this is a poem called Ode to Sleep. The sky jams where I am. Some clock jammed. Oh, excuse me, let me start over. Ode to Sleep. The sky shows where I am, some clock jammed at 4 AM. No need to destroy the stranger. Life camped out in a body. Bed foam, crumbs of concrete, 
a backpack, moonlight, then a flashlight heats up the night. Now sleep is a bottle smashed on a rock, shard snagged by riptide. She is tired, she said. She is a fire in a cave of exposure, ticketed for sleeping under the starry sky, the street a shapeshifter for the sleepless, the river a dragon of lights, the alley gripped by the hooves of a dumpster. Dreams without sleep are hallucinations, said Terry. O berry in a beak, ramshackled, seared. The body keeps on dreaming, disrobed of blanketed sleep. The street, a shapeshifter for the sleepless who spy. A fire of light on storefront glass, a phoenix dive bombing the sea. She pays a fare to sleep, cheek pressed to bust glass, pigeons, husky voiced coral, roost in the eaves of a hotel. A million doors in this city, and here, side by side, doors fence sleep, so she may meander into wakefulness rather than breaking awake. Hello, shadows moving on tent canvas, shadows slower, lowering into sleep. Oh, courage, heart, the heart is a new wound, worn old with pumping. Open the door between you and me, standing guard for each other to dream within the shelter of sleep. The heart an old wound, too. No need to destroy the stranger, war-torn, or at the next table, or sleeping on pallets beyond the fence of doors that gird uninterrupted sleep. So as I mentioned, there's a kind of full circle because now I'm back at this street newspaper that now I direct and um, I write a weekly column for it. And it's very interesting for me because it doesn't feel at all like it's a break. It feels very much like a continuation of this kind of practice. Um, I think that um, as someone who's a poet who loves form and loves the material of words, you know, uh, sentences themselves feel very much like they have a kind of musculature to them, a kind of physiology. And so um, I love having a form of seven to 900 words now that, that I write. Um, there's a kind of historic rhyming. Um, my, my, own, my grandmother had a very, um, like a, a childhood of precarious housing and homelessness. And one of the places that she lived was a hotel in Old Town called the Porter Hotel, where she finally, um, she was trying to get to high school, she's taking care of her brother and bed bugs and all the things that are really difficult. And she finally dropped out. And um, they, they went on a bus to LA to try to start over. And, you know, and the story continues. But that, I, I, she'd always told me about this. And in fact, I'd interviewed over the years. And, and she and my mother and I all created a book together of these years. But I never thought I would just find that hotel. She just said, oh, the Porter Hotel. And it's so funny because my years of research, you know, things are usually hard, but this was not hard. <laughs> and this actually, there was all kinds of record of it in the city archives because it was owned by a Japanese American, or not owned, managed by a Japanese American family. The Issei could not own property at that time. Um, and she lived there in 1941 and 42 at the time when people were rounded up and put into these incarceration camps. So it's like it folded back into this history. When I found the space, it's only a few blocks from where I work, I walked into the door and the historic sign um, was in the lobby. Of, it's no longer a hotel, but it was kind of amusing to me that actually this was right there all along. Um, again, just kind of a, a, a kind of historic rhyme. Um, so the last, last week of January, a group of people who are um, homeless, experiencing homelessness in there, and some organizers seized some land on the Columbia Slough and basically organized it around an idea of ecology. So they didn't move any underbrush or anything, but there were a lot of people camping there because people keep going into further out 
places, right? That there aren't enough shelters, there aren't enough, there isn't enough affordable housing. We know this all across the Northwest. Um, and so they wanted to figure out ways to organize into safety and haul out garbage and bring in potty, uh, porta potties and all of this. They called it the Village of Hope. This is one of the, the um, tents that they created a platform for. And I, I wrote about it in my column, and this is um, an extraordinary woman who was one of the houseless managers. Um, Carrie Wheeler, and they did, just like with Right to Dream 2, that incredible kind of synecdoche, the door, right, of that, like the part that stands in for the whole, um, with these balloons, and this is how they launched it. But that was on a Monday, February 2nd, on Friday, the city swept it. And um, it was, a, it, the police came in, the park rangers, the rapid response, which is the contractors. So I was, I covered that too. And um, one thing that was really extraordinary to me um, was kind of the full circle again with remember to wave and thinking about the ways in which um, uh, these things, you know, come back to us in these unexpected ways. Barbara was one of the women, one of the people um, at the camp uh, standing there actually who was packing up stuff on the side of the road. And Barbara said to me, I can only carry so many, backs, so many backpacks on my back at the same time with my precious items. And um, I was so struck when she said that by that language, only bring that which can be carried, right? And, and how this just repeats itself in this way in which folks are pushed out into imperilment and marginalization and, they, and their very possessions are at stake and taken from them again and again. Um, so there is a kind of powerful historic rhyme with that. Um, and I think I'll just close with, um, you know, thinking about kind of how I began talking about the Burnside Cadillac and the fact that writing articles for that showed me that I could also write about them in terms of poetry. And now I'm back writing these pieces, but the poetry is coming with me, and I'm thinking about what it teaches me that I can bring back into a newspaper. So I started just thinking about, I often think about the details and the repetition. So this is just um, the beginning of a column that I wrote last week. And many of our vendors recently sketched self-portraits with the artist Hel Helen Hill. These drawings adorn a wall of our vendor office, and I see them each day. I love these faces. These are the faces of people who love Star Wars and who have sisters who bake pies. These are the faces of people who tell puns and who wish people a good morning, even when theirs has gone terribly. These are the faces of people who warm their ears with knit caps. These are the faces of people who lost their last family photos when their backpack was stolen or their camp was swept. These are the faces of people who have endured slurs. These are the faces of people who write poems about sunsets and write poems about being treated like trash. These are the faces of people whose mothers called last week and who mo whose mothers died last year. These are the faces of people who sometimes just bear the day in silence, copies of street roots clutched to their chest. Um, and you know, I think about how, like, now that I'm doing this particular work um, that's about a problem that is so huge, income inequality, housing inequality, homelessness, and I think it exceeds the imagination. Um, and then I think about other, so many other things that so many folks in here are working around too, you know, climate change, right? These things that exceed the imagination and the way in which I, I feel like art, art steadies me in a very unkilter way for it because um, art shows me that there is always imagination for what you think there can't be, you know, the, going back to Lucille Clifton. So I think about it in terms of how is it that we conjure up a kind of excessive civic imagination, and I think the arts really help us with that. Thank you. That'd be and, great. Uh, I think the idea is to go to the microphone, which seems like it's on, if, if you have a question. I see a light on. Um, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that I really appreciate your work and the work that you do with the
Hello. Hi. Um, I'm actually from Portland. I'm somewhat familiar with Street Roots and uh, Right to Dream. And one thing I do know is that, like, with Street Roots, you frequently see uh, houseless people selling them on the streets. I see them by Powell's Bookstore all the time. And I've always just kind of wondered, how does it help the individual houseless person who is on the corner mm -hmm. selling them? Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a what's called a low barrier model and the fact that anyone can walk in and decide to do it they go through an orientation and then each person is operating like a small business mm -hmm. so they're buying their newspapers they get 10 to get started they buy their newspapers for a quarter and then they sell them for a dollar and then they manage all of that so you know we have someone who sells papers in St. John's and he's got this whole disciplined route and he comes in on Friday when the paper comes out and buys 300 papers and hits the streets and knows that that's the amount that he needs to sell. But some people come back over the week and okay. buy more papers. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it's something that I've always seen and always just kind of wondered about. Yeah, and real change in Seattle functions yeah. in that way too. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. So... I guess um, here in Olympia, you know, too, we have problems with homelessness and like mental health issues, especially downtown. And there's a lot of protesting that happens here, a lot of activism on both sides of, of the issue, you know, within the processes of the law and then within just on the streets and signs and everything. And basically, what it usually always really comes down to, like the primary issue with all of these things, isn't necessarily that the communities don't care. It's, it's the police, and it's the ways in which the police handle these issues. And so everybody has their own opinions on how we should approach things, but it seems like we need, we need to, like, I guess somehow, like, reform the ways in which police interact with the homeless and with mentally ill people. Um, I mean, literally last week or two weeks ago, there was uh, a woman who was sedated by the police because she was being erratic, in her behavior, and she actually they accident, accidentally killed her. Um, here in Olympia. Here in Olympia, yeah. And so we're we're and there've been a bunch of protests recently here about that um, specific issue downtown. And basically, I'm just wondering. My question for you is like, what do you think? What is what is the best way to go about f like helping these things? Is it better to just really go at the legal system and like go into you know the pol the politics of it? Or is it, can it be harmful to be protesting and like causing, would it cause the police to potentially be more violent or more unstable with their policies if, if people are, are too aggressive in their, from their perspective? It's just such a, I'm just curious what you think about the specifics with police interaction and how we should handle changing it. Mm. That sounds that incredibly sad. Um, what just happened, so. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's, one of the things that troubles me, the ACLU in Oregon has been really strong and good on this, is when laws target a particular class of people, so homeless people, the ACLU's been tallying all the different kinds of laws like that, and if we can identify those that really, why are we making life harder for the people who are already really just struggling? I feel like there's so many things that we do as a society that just make life harder, trauma harder. And um, I'm, I'm not giving you an, an easy response. I'm right. just sort of grappling with this. So it's like, yeah. on, I feel like my, um, my concern is both working on that end always, like how to make sure that the rights of the poorest people in any place are central and protected, while also grappling with the fact that there isn't enough housing, housing's too expensive, people can't even be indoors, and then they're being targeted with yeah. our laws when they can't, when the structure in place is making it impossible for them to even have a secure life. And then, and then they have to spend all their energy on just trying to survive. And then maybe they get their possessions taken away. And maybe they're thrown away because they're identified as trash. Or maybe they have to find them. And there's no way they can find them in the storage. You know, it goes on and on and on. So I just feel like we have this 
bizarre way of viewing poverty and homelessness. It's just really, really cruel. Absolutely. That's not really giving you a good, sure. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's just an incredibly painful situation that you're describing. And Absolutely. I mean, I think the best thing to do would be to actually create policies within the police departments to have more training and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But mm -hmm. to make that kind of change, it can take a lot of, a lot of groundwork. And so maybe as a community, people should be going to City Hall or going to um, even like on a the statewide level up in mm -hmm. Seattle or something like that, or just going to the Capitol building, actually attending meetings mm -hmm. and creating real change. Otherwise, you know, we can just keep protesting in the streets, but these things will keep happening. We it's need a, incredible endurance, yeah, yeah. right? I mean, we just can't do one thing. We have to do so much. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks for the answer. Yeah. Thanks for your wonderful presentation, Kaya. Thanks. So great to have you here. Um, you were speaking about being in, in Rio, I think, and um, a practitioner of Condomble who has a specific place um, that's, that was um, kind of paved over by the raising of that space by the Olympics. And then you talked about Lucille Clifton sort of inviting you to look and see what's maybe not obvious to see. And, and the work of sort of recovering um, what we what we might call vernacular landscape mm -hmm. in in our program we've been we had been thinking about this um, particularly in relation to Rob Nixon's book slow violence mm -hmm. and the environmentalism of the poor and this idea of the vernacular landscape and kind mm -hmm. of how part of what um, uh, gets lost with kind of um, commercial interests or corporate interests is, are those histories and knowledges, and it seems so core to your practice, mm -hmm. this kind of, and then the second, the, the, the method that seems so core that I wondered if you could speak a little bit about, more about, is listening, and this, so it feels like listening has, is central as a method, and that it, it is, um, and so I wonder if you might speak about how you think about what listening is, mm -hmm. how you listen, um, in, in other words, that it's a very active listening that you're doing and that the research and investigation is a form of listening. Um, and, and that notion of listening for something that is either hard to hear or, yeah. Um, and then also with your, all the, you do so many interviews. I mean, it seems like conversation and interview is central and that also entails listening. It just seems like you're, one of your, a way to describe your art is an art of listening. I love that. Um, yeah, I I think listening is um, is huge. I I do feel like at this point in my life, poetry and listening almost feel interchangeable to me in, in my own practice. And I think part of that is just the fact of the material itself, right? Is the stuff that we make together, language, and so everything that I'm writing down, everything I I'm thinking is coming from reading and listening. Um, and there's a kind of infinity to it that I think I love. That, you know, like today, just thinking about the arc of 20 years, um, I, I realize as I do that how everything carries forward, right? And um, you know, it'll be interesting 20 years from now, I'm sure it's all just going to feel like this big torrent. Um, but there's a way in which then with listening, it's never closing down. It's just moving into this kind of an incredible um, space in which everything that happens can just continue to accumulate. You know, like with Remember to Wave, I was so much more interested in letting that change than in just letting the binding of the book hold it so that other people's stories could become remembered a wave or the, the next thing that I would do. And that all felt very much like listening. Um, so I think there's a way in which it, I can create space. Um, there's a way in which I learn. There's a way in which I'm just, I guess, more interested in being taught through life and through other people. Um, 
But that said, with a very kind of active practice with a lot of strong ideas, right? So it's not just kind of blowing through the wind, but just always trying to usher. The word, verb usher always seems to be a part of the work I'm doing because it's like, you know, bringing it in, bringing it in, bringing it in, finding the form for the mess, bringing it in, bringing it in, finding form, finding form, because form get, can help us get to that significance. Um, yeah. I like to be surprised. Hi. You talk a lot about poetic investigative journalism. It's a great concept. Um, and obviously in journalism, the most important point is to be authentic and true to the story. Um, so I really would just like to hear like a touch more about your uh, and not needing to be an expert uh, about the story, and how do you get find the line of where you're telling the story authentically and well, and you're getting everything conveyed without being an expert on the yeah. exact situation? Yeah, I, I really appreciate that question. And there's a certain moment when I realized someone was asking why I didn't use the word amateur. And I thought, well, I still like having the word expert in there. <laughs> you know, it's sort of like it's showing, like, this is a lot of work. I'm not just kind of saying anything goes. I am really active in this whole process. Um, I am really dogged about research. And so I am sort of straddling that a little bit. Um, but I'm just, I, I just feel like it's irresponsible to try to nail down something, especially maybe I, there's a kind of freedom, I think, when I'm doing it through poetry and art, too, where because poetry, poetry brings this kind of connective thinking to it that I think is very uh, liberatory about it, you know. Um, are there other things that? I think I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think the word responsibility is in there, isn't it? Because response to listen, responsibility, this sense that we develop for ourselves of what is our responsibility in any given situation. And then that responsibility becomes more interesting to me than expertise. But they're, but they're kind of, they're, they're intersecting. investigative journalism, is, it's just the facts, you know, but mm -hmm. it seems like for you, getting to it through poetry is, it's doing something else, right? It's showing, I mean, we have students mm -hmm. who are doing investigative journalism through CPJ and so forth, and sometimes we can have an overdetermined idea of the difference between something like investigative journalism and poetry, and you're bringing them together. Yeah, that kind of, um, the, I, I guess the, like the idea of being dogged, the idea of being uh, working really hard, the idea of being curious, all of those qualities. Hi, um, I was just wanted to say thank you so much for coming and doing this. I've been writing poetry for the past couple of years and it's amazing to see somebody come out and kind of talk about all of this stuff, especially growing up in Seattle where homelessness is such a big issue from like, you know, noticing it when you were, six years old, kind of going up from there. Um, and uh, so thank you. Um, slight, I guess, change of topic, maybe. Um, but as somebody who's um, been thinking about publishing, um, I was wondering if you have any recommendations about how to go about publishing like a, a book of poetry, whether you would recommend doing self-publishing, what other techniques you would, you know, pursue, um, do you have any, any thoughts or recommendations on that? Well, I think, um, I think it's always a changing landscape which makes it really interesting. There's ways that you probably know more about it than I do in some of the changes, but um, I think, you know, there, there are ways, you know, a, a lot of the work that I've done has been through communities, um, communities of poets and other artists. I think of poets as being pretty amazing culture workers. A lot of the time it's because there's, there's so little, su the support structure isn't quite there unless we build it. Like we have to build the ground that we walk on. So 
oftentimes by, you know, if you're working in a community of poets in, in Olympia or in Seattle, um, have the presses emerge in those communities or you start a press um, the reading series the same way and people make broadsides for each other. I think that historically has been the, just the lifeblood of poetry is doing things like that. But I don't want to be putting aside other modes too in terms of you know maybe more regional or national publishers and how one um, navigates that. But I do think the lifeblood of poetry is the kind of cultural work of it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you like so here, much. Here, I'm sure there's there's always interesting things happening at Evergreen State College, right? Like that's just that's by that's by definition. I'm sure there's interesting collections, collectives, or publications or things happening. Thank you. Yeah. Um. So you uh, you talked a lot about like. Um, kind of basic human needs, especially when you mentioned sleep, um, uh, as like a, a, a factor in um, a lot of these, these populations that are, um, that, that, yeah, that don't have mm -hmm. access to a good place to sleep or, um, mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering what, how, how well language felt as like a communicator or what, um, what did you uh, learn about language um, looking at that like very desperate um, mm. like uh, mm. yeah points in uh, in the human existence yeah. or very essential yeah. things like what how did how did language n um, either conform or n need to further conform um, to that? I mean, I'm amazed by how many people that, who are living on the streets are writing poetry, you know? And with Street Roots, we have like a lot of poets who are selling the paper. So it's really alive, as well as painting and doing all kinds of art, other art forms. Um, trying to think, though, I feel like you're getting at something else that... Um, I, guess, I guess I meant how did... Uh how how well prepared as as someone who's studying language and and a poet um, did you feel to express need like how how prepared was was your sense of language for for that that level when of I'm meeting other people's needs well it's probably always inadequate but um, but I think that poetry definitely is a way of seeing other people I mean I think that that's there's a kind of um, I, I don't know, it's a kind of way of being awake in the world and asleep at the same time. It's kind of, a, there's a luster to it that, like, the, the person in front, um, the, the person who, there's always an encounter about it to me. And so for, for, it does seem to translate really well in that way. I also love the way that people all over the place are so creative with language. I mean, it's just really fun, isn't it? You might have some relatives that say jokes in really lively ways, or the ways in which people, you know, that um, that I'm working with every day use language. So I think that gets back to that that what I was talking about with poetry being the stuff that we all make together, and that it's made in these disparate but gorgeous ways all over the place. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Hi there. Um, I'm currently enrolled in a program that's looking at uh, the multiple dimensions of craft and design. Um, uh, graphic design? Craft and design. Uh, craft and design, oh great. Yeah, okay. so design kind of mm -hmm. as a broad field. Um, and I kind of have a specific question for you. Uh, how do you perceive privilege can be best utilized by artists and craftspeople without speaking for or over marginalized people? Mm. Well, I think that's just such a great question. I mean, I, I feel like um, Remember to Wave was definitely an exercise in me just trying to think, start to think through that um, in the sense that how do I write about a history in which my ancestors were not, did not suffer from it, but they're part of it, right? Because this is, 
the incarceration, World War II incarceration of Japanese American people is everyone's situation. Um, so how do I, how do I think about that responsibly? And I feel like that I just continually grapple with it and probably fail all the time. But the poem that I read, that autograph poem, was a little bit that kind of experiment. I wanted to write about people's lives and I wanted to write about them in specific ways, but I, um, I had to figure out my own procedure to make that really explicit that I was actually kind of banging up against that. Mm -hmm. And how do I autograph these pages with lives that I didn't know and I'm not close to? Yeah. Can I have a follow-up question? Yeah. Um, have you received any criticism that's helped um, you shape your relationship with privilege in your work? Mm. Yeah, let me think about specific examples. I think, you know, early on I remember that I was um, doing these guerrilla sign projects and, um, and another poet made sure I understood that it was my privilege as a white woman to take some of these risks. And, and that was really important to me. I mean, that's again one of these things that I just remember and think about. Sometimes when I think I'm being courageous or I think I'm taking risks, and then I think, actually, I just darn well should be doing that, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And also, privilege is playing into the fact that maybe I have a little more space to move. That was a, I mean, there's plenty of other moments like that, but that, when I'm thinking about that particular moment, it was profound. Thank you yeah. for your work. Yeah. Bless you. Well, thank you so much. I, and if anyone wants to talk afterward, I've had just such a nice time. It's really um, great to be in this space and know that you're all doing really, I'm sure, interesting thinking and work. And that's always just kind of fortifying for me, you know, just to know that there's just a lot, a lot of important work going on, especially in campuses like this. So, thank you.